can you guys hear me okay? Wow, it doesn't sound, I don't hear any echo at all. It's really strange. Okay, okay, so there it is. There's the title. So I'm going to talk to you today about our program that's um, bridging genomics research and culture-based science education through astrobiology in Hawaii. Uh, and the title is of our program, basically, is Onahoku Nanakiu o Kalani. Okay? Um, and I do want to say, first off, that I am here representing a big group of people. This is not something I'm doing on my own. Uh, everyone that's listed here is contributing in some way to really make this happen. Um, we're funded by NASA, NSF, and NOAA, all federal agencies in the United States, as well as the Edward E. Ford Foundation. And we come from a variety of institutions, nonprofit, public school, private school, universities, and uh, even Los Alamos National Lab is very much involved with this. You guys still hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, so to give this some context, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my postdoc research. Um, I'm a microbial ecologist, and I work in the field of astrobiology. And for those of you who are not familiar with astrobiology, that is the field, highly interdisciplinary field, that focuses on basically looking for life elsewhere in the universe. What's the distribution, evolution of life on uh, other planets, potentially, or anywhere? Uh, we ask big questions. Are we alone in the universe? Um, where might we find life? Big focus has been Mars lately. We, s we have all this new data from Mars. And so one, one place that I work in is in lava caves in Hawaii that are very similar to lava caves that we have on Mars. So this is a satellite image from uh, lava tubes on Mars. Um, and geologically, they're very, very similar to the, the lava tubes we have in Hawaii. Um, and I study biofilms, as he mentioned, microbial mats, biofilms, surface attached microbial communities that um, live in high density cell places, right? So they're in a polysaccharide layer. And I specifically study quorum sensing in those systems. So I'm interested in finding quorum sensing in these, these communities. And we know that quorum sensing, which is a gene regulation uh, system, if you guys are not familiar with that, <coughs> it basically um, can control bioluminescence, it can control biofilm formation, uh, virulence, if you work in the medical community, you might be very familiar with it. And uh, we don't know all the things that quorum sensing controls, but we know it's a community response to an environmental stressor. So long nanopore reads are really important to understand systems like the bioluminescence here in this bottom image, um, because we can find the whole system there, right? We can find the genes that are causing the quorum sensing and the genes that they control. So that's, especially for NASA, we're really interested in what is the, what's being controlled in this community environment, okay? Okay, so how does all that relate to culture-based science ed? So let me start with what culture-based science education is. That might be a term you have not heard. Has anybody heard that term before? Yeah, good, at least one, okay. Um, I can't give you this flat-out definition for it because it changes from place to place. So it changes with the culture that you're working with or the place you're working with. Place-based education also falls into this. Um, in Hawaii, what it's about really is developing the potential of every student through the mutual exchange of cultural and academic knowledge. Okay? And this includes cultural values. Right? So we're not separating things out like we tend to do in the sciences so much here. Okay? Um, this is an example of culture-based science education. It's been ongoing in Hawaii for a long time. This is Polynesian Voyaging Society. I know Thompson is the president here, and he's got his hand up like this. Anybody seen the cartoon Moana? Moana, admit it, everybody loves that cartoon if you've seen it. If you haven't, you've got to watch it. Moana is learning uh, wayfinding in this cartoon from the demigod Maui. And wayfinding is a real thing in Polynesian cultures. It is the way you navigate the seas. It's celestial navigation, and there is a lot of science involved in it. Okay? Um, I know it's doing that here. And that's just a, a good example of ongoing culture-based science ed. Uh, it's different in that it's that relationship between the teacher and student is different than I would say traditional or modern day education system. It's a mutual exchange. When you are a teacher, you are a learner. And when you are a learner, you are a teacher. Those things are really important. The other big base of it, like you see in this figure, is experiential learning. We learn by doing, okay? Um, <coughs> and self-identity is also very important. If you are a part of a community and you know what your responsibilities are, your juliana in that community, you're a lot more successful usually, okay? Okay, 
So we're pushing the envelope and saying, okay, let's build an astrobiology into culture-based science education. And there's our phrase again, onahoku, nanakiu, okalani. And as I said earlier, it means the <coughs> the eye, the spies of heaven are the stars. Okay, they're watching all of us. Um, the breath of heaven is translated us, translated to us through the stars. That's really about our place in the universe. And astrobiology, that's one of the big questions, is are we alone? This is a question everyone has always asked throughout time, right? Most cultures have asked this question. So we can connect that way to culture-based science education and astrobiology, but also we can connect through the caves themselves. So um, in this case, uh, so we got a picture of our caves again. This is a picture of a cave entrance near um, Kilauea, which is the volcano on the Hawaiian Islands. They, the Hawaiian Islands are made by the volcano, if you're not familiar with that. So in native Hawaiian culture, the caves and the volcano are like the belly of life. Life comes from the caves. So Kilauea is this very destructive force, but it's also this life-giving force. So we can start talking about the microbes that we find in those caves. And what we see is we see these early representatives of life on Earth. This is an example on the left here, cyanobacteria, Gliobacter kilauensis. It's named after the volcano. This is the, it's the purple mat that we see on the walls in the cave, and this is it in culture in the lab. And it's actually the sister group to all cyanobacteria on Earth, um, the Gliobacter genuses. So we see the same information is actually being communicated in a lot of ways, that um, these beginnings of life happen in the caves. Okay, so to make all this happen, we're doing teacher training in genomics and culture-based science ed. We have, we have another one coming this year uh, in June. And um, this is pictures from previous workshops. And this year, we actually were doing some cultural exchange with Scotland. We have someone coming from Scotland, Lewis Ho. He's going to teach us the nanopore reel. He's designed a Scottish folk dance because he combines science and dance music. And he's going to teach all of the Hawaiian teachers uh, how to do a reel, and it's going to be the nanopore reel. He's already designed it, actually. So, and we go through the whole process in the workshops. We do DNA extraction all the way through bioinformatics. And I'll tell you a little bit about the bioinformatics platform that we use that Los Alamos National Lab designed, um, just to give you an idea. And this year, we're going to exclusive. We're going to really focus on the Minaya. We actually have someone from Oxford Nanopore coming to our workshop. Um, the other way we kind of push this forward is cl through collaboration with Iolani School, which is a private school on the island of Oahu. And they collaborate with our research uh, to investigate quorum sensing. Um, and we basically, what we do, we, we started easy. We gave them cultures to start with. And uh, the students are actually, they do DNA extraction, and then they use the rapid kit in the classroom, and they're able to do this. And then they use the Edge Bioinformatics platform, which is a free and very user-friendly platform that has nanopore tools along with other tools as well. It's got a bunch, but it actually has a specific set for uh, nanopore reads. And they generate whole genomes. And that, that's actually of value in our research. So they're really a part of the whole research process. Um, these are pictures of the young ladies at St. Andrews uh, actually sequencing. I'm going to show you what they, what they got here. I only have time to show you one thing that they have, that they've done so far. But this is a novel species that we found in a, a cave, Kalmana Cave. Um, and the Minion data is in that, that it's sort of purple. Does it look purple to you guys? Um, they got 12.3 gigabytes of data off of a flow cell. I have never gotten 12.3 gigabytes of data off a flow cell. So I'm thinking that I just need to give all of my samples to the kids and I'll get good data. <laughs> so they did, a, they did a really great job. This you can see over here on the right, the histogram of their read length. They had over 7,000 KB, or 7 KB, sorry. Um, and uh, over 500x coverage uh, off of Flynn flow cells. It's insane. We've actually had to subsample it just to assemble it because it like breaks the assemblers. Um, we also did Illumina MySeq with the same, the same test tube, same culture. Um, to see what we were getting using Minion and compare and to be able to do hybrid assemblies. And this is a picture, a TEM image of, of this species here. And we know it's a, a symbiotic species of plants from looking at the, the genes. Um, and this is a comparison of the assemblies. So the kids did the top three in the red, the brown, and the tan here. And they did all that in edge. So if in the, t uh, the brown there is the Illumina only, a spades assembly. And you get 136 contigs. 
And with the Minion only data, we get three. We're not sure if it's three separate contexts or we might actually have two plasmids and one chromosome, a uh, circular chromosome. We're not sure yet. And the unicycular hybrid assembly, the bottom one, we did that outside. It hasn't been incorporated into the edge platform yet. And we get it into one contig. Um, it's a pretty big genome. And this is just a visual comparison. The colors match the table there. Um, you can see we're getting really good coverage. There are gaps, of course, in the annotation. But um, it's not gaps necessarily in the, in the sequence. Okay, so ono hoko nanaku o kalani. Another way that I would interpret this phrase in this context is that we're really all in this together and we're all working towards a common goal. Um, so Oxford Nanopore Technology is basically giving us the ability to teach genomics and sequencing in the classroom through experiential learning. Mm -hmm. I wish I had had this opportunity when I was a kid. I would be way better at what I do if I had. <laughs> I mean, they're learning things that I didn't learn until I was like finishing my PhD um, by doing this. And they're generating real data, and they're a part of a NASA-funded project, and they know that. And that makes them scientists. And that's really important because they feel like they're part of the community, and they're much more likely to listen to what scientists have to say then. Okay? Um, they're actually contributing to that community. They have a responsibility, a kuleana in that community. Um, the data generated actually does help us. We, it's not just a classroom activity. This is Dr. Stuart Donaghy, my PhD advisor, who I still work with. Um, we select those strains uh, to use in the Mars chamber for further testing to do transcriptomic type work to look at quorum sensing genes and the genes that they, um, that they control in that Mars chamber. And genes tell us stories. That's the thing. We can actually start to make our own stories um, out of the science that we learn. So um, what I would say to everybody is, uh, after listening to this, is where in your research can you really connect with community and culture? And don't think of those things as separate. As scientists, we tend to think of those things as separate. But sacred spaces, um, culture is actually important to us all. Right? And we should not just exclude those kinds of conversations. It does not mean you're teaching religion. But to talk about these things with a cultural perspective gives it more value to people. So, and with that, I will say mahalo.